welcome to Pilates Teacher's Manual, your guide to becoming a great Pilates teacher. I'm Olivia, and I'll be your host. Join the conversation and the Pilates community on Instagram at Pilates Teacher's Manual, and visit buymeacoffee.com slash Olivia Podcasts to support the show. Today's chapter starts now. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. Today is another wonderful day because I have a special guest on the podcast. This is my friend and colleague, Dan Baker. Dan is a fabulous Pilates teacher, an inspirational mentor to a lot of people in teacher training. He has his own studio, Pilates with Dan, in Canberra in Australia. And it is, first of all, amazing that our times have aligned, that we can have a chat. Um, because Dan lives in the future from my perspective, and I live in the past. So thank you so much for making time, Dan, to come on the show. G'day, g'day. Um, uh, welcome from the future. <laughs> it's it so, is the future. I'm, I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> yeehaw. Um, so you got the good day and I got a yeehaw, and, and now we have accurately represented <laughs> yes, uh, both yeah. of our countries. <laughs> Fabulous. So thank you for coming on. And I'm even more excited. I said this before we started recording, but I'm going to say it again. Like, I don't know the answers to these questions that I'm asking him. And I think sometimes, you know, you work with people and you don't know what their first Pilates class was like. You just know them as this really awesome teacher that you hang out with occasionally. So Dan, tell me, what was your first Pilates experience? How did you get in the game? It's an interesting question. And uh, it depends on how far back you want to go, I suppose. My first experience of Pilates was weird. I was on this weird machine. I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> um, things were happening. Uh, so it was, a, it was a weird experience. I kind of went on a bet or a, a dare many, many years, many, many moons ago when Dan was much younger. I had cancer. And the cancer presented as a tumor in a few different places, but one of them was on my spine. And um, it, it was such a large mass that it was pressing on my spinal cord. And so I had to have a pretty scary back operation to remove the, the, the tumor. And basically, at, at that point, I was 27. It was kind of like life interrupted a little bit, and I really um, wasn't in a good way. <laughs> um, and I kind of like my life ended as far as I was concerned. And uh, part of the rehabilitation for this major back surgery, so they did what was called a partial laminectomy, which removed part of two vertebrae. Uh, and to relieve pressure on the spinal cord because the tumor had been pressing on the spinal cord and I'd lost function uh, for my legs. Anyway, so uh, it was a, a, a very quick, long period of time of rehabilitation because when I look back at it now, it's kind of like a blink of the eye. But um, part of that work was I was in a back brace for eight months. I couldn't, I couldn't leave my bed without having the back brace on. So that became my spine and uh, did a lot of hydrotherapy and strength training to try and be upright again. That, that went on for about seven months. And uh, then one, I, I, I basically got strong enough that I didn't need the back brace anymore, which was a happy day, <laughs> a very, very happy day. And I had seen the benefit of exercise in, in, in kind of uh, rehabilitation. And I, I was determined never <laughs> to need that back brace again. So um, I took it upon myself, even though the physiotherapist at the time had said, okay, you're, you're good to go. I felt that I wasn't. So at the end of the day, I was exhausted all the time. I, I, I just, I just wasn't um, my usual happy Dan self. 
So I took it upon myself to find an exercise regime that would help me. And I decided at the time that swimming was the go, mainly because I had enjoyed the hydrotherapy so much. But I, I decided swimming was a go because it, it incorporated a bit of cardiovascular work, a bit of strength work with the resistance in the, in the water. I could, I could measure it with laps and time in the pool. So in my brain, it, it kind of fit, ticked a lot of boxes. So uh, I started swimming and I was swimming f- three, four, five times a day. Uh, for kilometers and, 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 and getting right into it. So I was really, really keen. And my best mate, uh, his wife started swimming as well. She was uh, postpartum trying to get into exercise again. So she would join me for laps and we would chat at the end of, you know, half a K sort of thing and just be puffing at the end of the pool and, and chatting away. And she said, have you heard of Pilates? And I'm like, what? What's that? And she said, I'm going, I'm, I've booked in for a session um, next Tuesday night. Do you want to come with me? And I think this is my, the, the key pivotal mo- moment of my life was I thought, sure, why not? So I went along because <laughs> what have I got to lose, right? Like it's I've, this weird, what's this place? I didn't even research what it was before I, I turned up. So I turn up and there's these two reformers. There's this little studio in here in Canberra. And I turned up and, and gave it a go and I thought, oh, that was that was weird, but okay. And then I was feeling muscles the next day that I hadn't felt for a long time. The teacher was really good. She guided us through what I know now as a whole bunch of pre-Pilates work <laughs> and a little bit of work on the reformer. But I kind of like, oh, this kind of is nice. So I started doing one session a week with my friends um, and then that, that became two sessions a week and <laughs> and so on and so forth until basically I was there every other day, maybe sometimes four or five days a week and, and um, I just became in love with it. I think your story puts um, physical therapy into a really clear perspective that when you're in the midst of physical therapy, whether you're rehabilitating after a surgery or an injury or anything, that it feels so hard and so overwhelming and so frustrating. And then you look back and you're like, oh, that was like a few weeks or a few months. And you know, here I am. Um, it resonates with me because my mom's recovering from a hip replacement. And especially this like gap between your physio says, so Australians call them physios. We call them physical therapists in the US. Oh, sorry, um, everybody. <laughs> no, you're fine. You're fine. Uh, it's totally fine. But, you know, she finished like her, it's not court mandated, but the doctor says you get 10 sessions of physical therapy. And my mom was like, you know, I still can't get in and out of a chair. So I feel like I'm not actually done with physical therapy or I'm not done with exercise. Like I don't feel like I'm ready to, you know, do the rest of the things that I usually do. And so something like Pilates, and as you found pre-Pilates, can be really amazing in terms of filling gaps for our clients when they, their physio says, all right, your leg does what it's supposed to do, so you're good. And you're like, yeah, I don't really trust that leg, though. (laughs) It's like these, these benchmarks that they have to tick off don't quite meet what you actually need, but it's good enough. It's, it's, it's this gap, isn't it? that I think uh, something like Pilates definitely worked for me. Uh, I'm always appreciative of that dare, <laughs> that day, that fateful day, that dare to come along I mean, to Pilates class. I think that's amazing. I think it also shows your kind of like little sense of adventure. You're just like, yeah, all right, I'll give it a go. Like, exactly. Like, why not? I think a lot of us end up in things that we just gave it a go, like, wildly my partner like i only went to korea on a let's give it a go uh situation and now i'm like speaking the language and married to someone um life's wild um so how did you make the jump from being a super pilates enthusiast to saying you know i actually want to teach like i want this to be what i do for work not just what i do for fun 
Yeah, so I think um, it go- it goes back to my my cancer. Um, sorry to keep bringing that up, but um, it kind of changed my mindset about who I was and where do I fit into this universe. <laughs> you know, so if it wasn't for the cancer, I probably wouldn't have said why not try Pilates. You know, my whole uh, career trajectory had changed because of the cancer. Beforehand, I was I was on the pathway of of becoming a researcher in in um, medical science and down that pathway, basically staring down a microscope for the rest of my life. Which at the time I was like, oh, I'm so into this. This is great, but <laughs> it certainly it made me go, well, hang on, <laughs> do I really want to do that? And because of my own personal experiences with how Pilates had helped fill that gap. I had uh, one Christmas, uh, I was talking to my extended family and a lot of them, again, didn't know what Pilates was at all and thought I was a bit weird. But to a person, they're, they're all saying, well, you know, you seem really excited about this thing that you've discovered. Why, why don't you turn that into a career? And so I was reflecting upon that and and then the the studio that I was a serial pest at which you know I was doing six classes a week you know some back to back classes and things like that and I I basically was hanging out at the studio as a, a spare thing they uh one of the teachers there sort of said hey did we've got this course coming up do you want to apply for it and and learn a little bit more about pilates and I'm a big fan of the the universe shows you the way sometimes, and and that was my moment. I thought, again, it's it's kind of like the my first class. I I thought, thought, why not? You know, what what have I got to lose? <laughs> the timing is perfect, always. Yeah. yeah, always. So, what was this training experience like? I know that people who listen to the podcast have a variety of experiences in teacher training. Sometimes people are looking into teacher training. So just tell me a little bit about how yours was structured and how you kind of moved through uh, sure. choreography and stuff. Sure. Um, I suppose now it looks a little bit old fashioned, but it was a, a model of training that was, from what I could tell, was the way to go at the time. So this is back in uh, start of 2007, end of 2006, start of 2007. Uh, the, the model was basically hundreds of hours of observation, intensive weekends of theory, then uh, a lot of practice, uh, hundreds of hours of practice. And so the, the course took probably somewhere in the order of seven to eight months, I think. Oh, I have to pull out the old certificates. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so it was about seven to eight months, and if I remember right, it was somewhere in the order of two hundred and fifty hours of observation and six hundred hours of practice. Yeah, so it was a, a really intensive model. What? So there I were- need to stop complaining about my. 80 hours of <laughs> observation. <laughs> Holy moly. Yeah, That's wild. But, but I mean, if we look back now, it's it's a kind of old-fashioned way of doing it. But it did mean that I was in the studio a lot and I saw a lot of stuff and I saw how teachers could modify things and, and adjust things to their uh, clientele. They could sort of... I was enamored by that that interaction a little bit. And the other thing that I, I kind of realized is that Pilates is more than just what I was doing, what I was doing with with um, my own body. It was it was broader than that. It was um, a bigger thing. And that that spurred me on to to complete the course. So uh, the course started, there was five of us when we started. <laughs> And by the end of that marathon, it was three of us. The great thing about the course for my future was that at the end of it, the studio said, hey, there's a job here for you if you want. 
So it basically meant that I had a very clear pathway into a job. And then str- straight after being qualified, I had, a, I had a full-time job. I was a full-time teacher. And it was just like, wow, this is intense. <laughs> yeah, holy yeah. moly. So what a, what qualifies as full-time teaching for you? Please tell me not 40 hours. Please say not 40 hours. Dan. Okay. Um, no, it was um, hours. it was 30, 35 hours per week. You superhuman, you. Um, but uh, I've since that day, I've always taught at least that. Dan. Dan is I, another um, level. <laughs> um, so it's uh, – and I, I, I do realize that some people look at me as if I've – grow a second head or somewhat insane but it's i don't know I, I thrive off of it some somehow i'm jealous because i mean i know exactly what you're talking about like there's that total feel good rejuvenating energizing thing but and i don't know like i'm introverted so sometimes the group stuff is like this is really fun i would like to go sit in a room by myself <laughs> yeah, for I- another three days please <laughs> The irony is that I am also, uh, uh, I've got a mild case of introversion and um, that I do need, I do need to have that time to recharge the batteries away from people. And uh, yeah, it's this conflicting, I really love the energy in the space, but I also need that time away. Yeah, you're like poking holes in all my excuses to be like, oh no, sorry, I can only teach a maximum of 30 hours a week, then I'm just not my best self. Dan's like, 60 big. hours, here we come. <laughs> I, I, Overtime I have, Pilates. I have taught, the, the most I've ever taught was 50 hours, a fi- oh, sorry, 50 classes in a week. That's the most I've ever taught. And, and I'm just going to say that, objectively, that's too many. That is, it is so it is. much. And so that that. Uh, that had lasted for about two weeks, and at so that point, I thought, "Oh, I should probably hire a teacher, <laughs> hire another teacher." And so, I yeah, I, I am did. glad we're getting into this because speaking of your lovely Pilates career, not only did you, on a whim, on a bet, go into Pilates land and then fall in love, and then be like, "Maybe I'll do this training thing since it's happening right here in the studio I already love," and then you're working full-time at this studio. How did Pilates with Dan, your studio, come into being? Well, Pilates with Dan is actually my second ever studio. So (laughs) so what ended up happening with the previous studio here in Canberra is that um, I was working full-time and over the course of probably 18 months, uh, I became like the senior teacher in the studio, and the studio owner started to branch out. They um, built a second studio in Canberra, and so there were two studios. And so I was kind of the senior studio in one, and she was a senior teacher in in the other. And then I was approached to, well, do you want to buy the studio? After much discussion and and going into debt, I decided, oh yeah, that's that's good, that's good. I'll do that. Yeah. And so, stupid little deer in headlights, Dan, thought, oh yeah, I'll do this, and 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 it's going to be great. And um, long story short, that didn't work <laughs> because you can't be working thirty to forty classes a week and run a studio and lead it a team of teachers and and it just doesn't work um and so that ended in disaster but i learned a lesson <laughs> and so uh so from that um i actually took 18 months off teaching i was really burnt out by the industry i thought uh, who are these people that are running the show here it's crazy it's not worth it yeah, I was not a happy camper, uh, and we, my wife and I, uh, we were expecting our second child, and there was all these different stresses, and it was a wild time. And I don't necessarily regret the decision to purchase the studio, 
that I was working in. But and the reason why I don't regret it is because I, I learned valuable lessons. And again, I'm a big kind of universe shows you the way sort of guy. If I hadn't had that experience, I wouldn't have what I have now. So, you know, that's that's the lesson I learned there. I was going to say like a phoenix rising from the ashes, Dan. <laughs> Here you are I, with the dream. I didn't want to go that cliched route. <laughs> But there you are. You did it. It's the only so. thing I was thinking. I was like, like a phoenix, Dan. Say like yeah. a phoenix. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so like a phoenix rising from the ashes. Um, my wife was really supportive during this time. I, I was really not in a happy space. And um, my wife was very supportive at the time. And um, I had sold off everything, all, all the equipment, um and because I didn't really want to do this thing anymore, it's stupid and blah, blah, blah. But my wife wisely <laughs> said, oh, we'll just keep, we'll just keep a, a reformer and we'll keep a Cadillac and we'll keep a, a wonder chair. <laughs> you know, it was story in the garage. She knew. Um, she's very smart. And so we, we stored it in the garage and, and let dust settle on it for a long time. And as I said, my wife was expecting a second child and um, she was gently prodding me to say, hey, I really need some Pilates to help me with this pregnancy. Um, so we, we dragged the reformer out and put it in the lounge room. And I um, love that. And so I started teaching her while she was pregnant and then she had a work colleague who was also pregnant. And so <laughs> it, it just gradually grew from there. <laughs> Surprise, you were running a studio again, Dan. <laughs> so so in my we uh, commandeered the lounge my lounge room and we we just stuffed it full of equipment <laughs> or what what we had and I just started teaching classes to a select few people mostly friends and family and then I got in touch with some old clients of mine from the previous studio and they they were super keen that I was teaching again and big thanks to them because if they hadn't have started coming I probably would have not done anything and then they started coming and I started having three four five days a week <laughs> in my lounge room which is maybe 30 square feet I, I think that's the right terminology it's about 10 square meters, so about 30 square feet. So it's not a big room, but we could we could fit a whole bunch of people in there and, and then word of mouth started happening as it always does. And um, I, I taught in, in my lounge room and in a, uh, a gym hall for two years classes. And then I decided uh, this is getting too smaller space i need a bigger space so i branched out and started renting a, a commercial space and built the studio up from there and as i said i there, there was a point where i was working 50 hours a week for a couple of weeks and then i decided oh, i can't do this forever uh we uh found a, another teacher that i had previously worked with in my other studio so and and we built it from there I think that is the right choice because as much as I'd love to multiply you, um, not possible. <laughs> and I think it's also, I hope that you are not always, you know, seeing the beautiful things about yourself. So I just want to shine a quick little light on like, how incredible is it that the people you had worked with before were like, oh my gosh, you're teaching Pilates again. Can I come? Um, I think that shows that, you know, the positive impact you were looking to make in people's lives the same way Pilates had made in your life. Like you were definitely doing that for people. And I'm glad that, that you got in touch. Well, I think the mistake I, I made is I got too caught up with, I, I kind of had lost the, what was the reason that I was doing it in the first place? And I got caught up with the, oh, I'm going to be a studio owner. I'm going to teach and lead all this stuff. And we can do workshops and I can do teacher training. And it's just like, hang on, back up the truck. I actually started this to, to let people find the little spark that I found, the little 
fire, light the little fire within them. That's what I was actually teaching for. And and you know when you're teaching and you you see it in the in the client's face that aha moment where they and we I've, I've talked to many police teachers and they all go oh yeah I know that I know that moment that moment that's what I teach for and it's just like that's the fuel that keeps me going is the, those little aha moments where you see it in the client's face they go oh <laughs> you know it's it's sorry this is audio but I've made this awesome facial expression where you you know it and any police teacher that has seen it will know that look you know and that's that's what I actually love. And so when when those clients agreed to come back to me, it's like I realized, oh, this is why I teach. Oh, not the other thing. <laughs> yeah. So Hi there. I hope you're enjoying today's chapter so far. There's great stuff coming up after the break too. Be sure to subscribe wherever you're listening and visit buymeacoffee.com slash Olivia Podcasts to support the show. There you can make a one-time donation or become a member for as little as $5 a month. Membership comes with some awesome perks, including a shout out in the next episode, a monthly newsletter, a monthly Zoom call with me, and more. You can also visit links.oliviabioni.com slash affiliates to check out some sweet deals on products I use and love. Now back to the show. You've shared a lot how your time management, potentially, of classes that you're teaching has evolved over uh, time. But how have you seen your teaching evolve? Because you've worked with teachers, you know, in all stages of their uh, teacher training and beyond process. And now as a studio owner, again, how, how do you stay connected? Well, that's a separate question. I was going to say, how do you stay connected to the spark? But also, how has your teaching changed? That's two different things. <laughs> okay. So when I was a, a, a baby teacher, <laughs> a little neophyte, um, I was very much a micromanager. So my training was a contemporary Pilates, but um, tra- like, isn't Pilates training weird? So be- because I only knew of contemporary Pilates, that's all I knew. And there was no real opportunity in, in my city to learn anything else. Uh, so classical, I only found out about classical Pilates when I started the training. I only knew it was a thing. And there's no, there, at the time, if I wanted to do classical training, I, it would require a massive apprenticeship in another state. <laughs> So I'd have to move and do an apprentice. It's just like, that's not feasible. It wasn't feasible at the time. There was no option. I also just want to jump in real quick. States in Australia are like if every state was Texas, like they're huge. <laughs> it's not like, oh, I'm just going to drive for three hours and hit five states on like the East Coast in the US. It's like, let me drive for three hours and I'm still in the same state and I can still see the gas station. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so the, the even the more city, big, even spread out. The the city I'm talking about is it's about 500 miles away. Um, so that's so Sydney. If if your listeners know where Sydney is, it's the most famous city in Australia. is about 500 kilometers away from Canberra, and but Canberra is the nation's capital. Just want to put that out there. <laughs> Sydney is not. <laughs> um, so where was I? So uh, there was, there's no option. There was no option to, no, no feasible option to do any other training except contemporary. And the nature of contemporary Pilates at that time is, and this is this is with twenty years hindsight now. So bear that in mind. Was very much a, a lot of pre Pilates, a lot of rehabilitation. It's borderline physical therapy training uh, or physiotherapy training. And 
there's a lot of safety culture, I suppose, or like scare stuff. Oh, this person's got a disc bulge, so we cannot do X, Y, and Z. Uh, you must do ABC. And if, I, if, if during the training you are doing X, Y, and Z, you will fail the training. That's a hard fail. And so you have to reset your test out again, sort of thing. So um, there's a lot of a lot of you can't do this if this person has X, Y, and Z injury. And so I became a master master of uh, micromanagement. <laughs> so I was all, like in there, and and again hindsight twenty twenty hindsight. Um, physical cueing over the top and palpating people and just uh, uh, movement assessment tests and uh, posture assessments and uh, and I look back and go oh yuck <laughs> but but at the time I was right in that and and I became very very good at telling people what not to do and I think I'm not sure I can't point to exactly when but at some point in that journey, you, I mean, you can have as many movement rules as, as you want, but there's going to be times when it doesn't work on somebody, despite your training saying it will. And what was happening is that I was, because I was the lead trainer there, I was getting the more complicated pathologies, the, the people with the most complex pain histories and injuries and things like that. And these movement rules, these um, what not to do's and what to do's weren't working. <laughs> they they simply weren't working. That's started me on a path of questioning a lot about the training, which you know ends up leading me to other training courses and and trying to figure out more and and educate myself on on different aspects of rehabilitation and the more the more you research the the more you realize you didn't know the truth you know i had a similar teacher training that was very pre pilates um, where the studio was located a lot of the clients were older and had you know more stuff going on in your bodies and it was very much like a gentle don't go too far don't do too much safety culture as well. And I don't know about your experience, but same thing, learning posture assessments and uh, movement screens and all of this. And the teacher trainer would be like, oh, and you can see, you know, this rotation and this shoulder's higher. And I was like, I don't see that. Like, I don't see that at all. Like, what's wrong with me that I don't know that their scapula is dyskinesising or something? <sighs> yeah. And and uh, I was like, maybe this isn't for me because I, I don't have the eye. Like, I can't tell. And then you learn that no one can tell. <laughs> well, I, I had this, I had this moment, this, this horrifying moment. <laughs> well, I, it was horrifying for my, my ego, I suppose. Um, I was at a, a, a Pilates conference here in Australia and um, some, a, a very famous Pilates person uh, who has got their own school of Pilates and and is well regarded and look I've I've been in a class with this person and they teach an awesome class like unbelievable anyway they they were running a workshop on the wonder chair I think it was um, and basically uh, going through a whole bunch of for one of a better word, assessment tests on on how to do movements and and things like that, and we're split up into small groups, and so everyone is a Pilates professional, um, well well regarded and everything, and we're in these small groups and we're we're doing these exercises, and we're being asked to palpate people and and things like that, and so I think I'm I think I'm doing the right thing, or what what they're wanting to do, but. Um, this person comes over and just gives me this look and 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 says, "What are you doing? <laughs> Can't you see that this this and this is wrong?" And I actually inside I I, I felt really bad. I thought, "Oh no!" I, I and then I look back and I think I couldn't actually see what 
that person was seeing could not for want of, and I'm turning to the other members of our group and and they're just giving me blank looks like they're not trying to engage with me at all and and it was the weirdest experience but it was also an experience that taught me a lot that Sometimes people see things that aren't there and sometimes you're being asked to see things that you can't physically see. And it it was a humbling moment, let me just say. Yeah, well, I mean, there's we know now because, you know, we've studied more, we've, you know, read more research, but things like visually assessing someone's neutral spine is not a thing. And if you had, you know, a bunch of teachers or physical therapists or whoever's trained to look at spines and say that they're neutral, um, it is like everyone sees things slightly differently, you know, as we're finding. And to limit someone's movement expression because we see, oh no, your tailbone is tilted or tucked or askew or floating in space, whatever. <laughs> um, like you've said a couple of times that you got really good at telling people what not to do. And it's so funny that as movement teachers that a lot of us have had, you know, training experiences where you spend so much time telling people not to move things. And it's like, wait know, a minute, right? <laughs> aren't we supposed to move? Like, isn't that the goal is to That's move everything? That's the irony, isn't it? It's... Um... I think the moment that I was able to let that go, I don't know, it made the world a brighter place or something. You know, sunshine and and and, and rainbows were started appearing everywhere. It it became a nicer experience. It became you can- nicer to teach, and I, from my client's perspective, it became nicer in in terms of the vibe of the studio as well. I've never liked telling people, you know, what they're doing wrong or stopping them in the middle of doing something because, uh, oh, well, this foot isn't in the right place. Um, Bodies are strange and things feel better in places. So when we're looking at things like where your pelvis should be or where your foot should be, um, we should let our clients be the guide to some degree. Like if you're doing a lunge, yeah, I want you to bend one of your knees, please. That's what a lunge is. But how we go about doing that, because everyone's body does its own thing, you can learn a lot from a client by letting them move and figure things out for themselves. Like what if they problem solved? Like what if they found that for them? Um, so much more like linking back to you finding the spark, like that's the spark for me is sometimes, you know, you tell people to do something and they do something else, not because they're malicious, (laughs) but because that's how they understood it. And, you know, sometimes that's kind of cool because we can use that as a jumping off point. And so isn't that interesting? You can have this moment of either they, they haven't understood you, which is a communication issue, which as teachers something we should be really good at but but sometimes what you say is interpreted differently by them and that can open up a pandora's box of other movement options and so in that moment they're teaching you how to teach them if that makes sense and so that they're those moments they're they're the aha moment for the teacher so you have an aha moment for the student but the aha moment for the teacher is like, oh, maybe Kathy's knee wants to go that way. Let's let's explore some movement in that direction, or you know, that sort of thing. And that's that's kind of cool. That's yeah, because really stopping cool. them and being like, no, I meant this, and it's like, all right, well, I just shut a door that had you know possibilities behind it. Because like we can always circle back. Like it's not like anyone has your Pilates plan and is watching you follow it to a letter. If something else comes up, then we go there. We're allowed to do that. Like We're it's just to. Pilates. <laughs> it's just some Pilates. So it's it's kind of like when when you're in that uh, uh, stop moment and I want you to do this. Why is it the reason that you want that to happen? Is it because you've been told uh, the glutes need to work here and the hamstrings need to work like? Are you being beholden to movement options that are actually archaic and actually don't exist? Or uh, can you be open in that moment to explore something else for that client? And it's, I'd, I'd, 
I now choose to be open <laughs> to that experience. And that's a choice. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, you telling uh, someone telling someone not to do something is wrong. It's just that you close choices and you shut off choices. And that I think as like as I get older, Olivia, <laughs> um, as I get older, I, I realize that life's too short for too much no. One of my philosophies, which I've shared a lot on the podcast, is that even if someone is doing something like to your Pilates teacher eyes is like egregiously wrong, <laughs> you won't be able to show them another way to do it if they never come back to your class. Bingo. Oh, yeah. So if yeah. you really want to refine something, no, I want you to bend your knees before your elbows in coordination on the reformer, something like that. If the client is turned off by the experience because they think you're micromanaging or that they're not good at it because all you're doing is telling them what's wrong with what they're doing, then they don't get to have that, you know, liberating, freeing, empowering experience that a lot of us love and look forward to in Pilates. And like, unlike physical therapy where you have a set number of sessions, unlike, you know, you see your doctor because you're leading up to a surgery, they come to see us multiple times a week for months and years and decades. Like we have time to mm -hmm. refine choreography, but if they don't come back, then. Yeah. We have a saying in, in well, sorry, I, I say we, I have a saying in the studio um, that, that each new exercise is like a rock and within the rock is a jewel, but we've got the rock to start off with. And every time we do it, we're just going to polish that rock a little bit more and we're just going to get, and who knows how long it's going to take us to get to the jewel inside, but we'll get there. It's just that, okay, today we're just going to polish off another layer and that's, that's, the, that progress over time. You have shared a lot how um, you, you know, took what you learned in your first teacher training, took what resonated with you because you did have a fabulous experience with this Pilates studio, even though their teacher training program had a lot of, you know, must do this, must not do this kind of teaching. Knowing what you know now with all of your wisdom and years of experience, what is your advice for new teachers who are just getting started themselves? Advice for new teachers? Oh, so much, Olivia. There's so many, like, it, it's like there's so many new things with new teachers. You just want to give them a hug and say, it's going to be okay. <laughs> it's going to be okay. Um, I think the, the biggest lesson that I learned was – it's okay to do something wrong. It's okay for you to do something wrong as a teacher, and it's okay for the student that you're teaching to do something wrong. Um, we get so fixated on doing it perfectly, where whereas the messy moments, they're actually the best moments. They're, they're the moments that you learn most from. So, I mean, if you mumble up your words, it's okay. No one's going to storm out of the class because you said your right elbow instead of your left foot. Um, <laughs> it's You can make a joke about it if that's the sort of personality you are, or you can just move on and just go to the next thing. And, you know, if, if your student bends their knees instead of straightening them when you ask the other way, it's okay. You're just polishing that rock. <laughs> so I think... It's a it's a really hard lesson and and something that some people can do better than others. But don't beat yourself up over the the mistakes you make. You're going to make mistakes. It's okay. No one's going to die. The, with the people come to to enjoy movement with you or be shown how to do movement. Um, so if you're too fixated on making mistakes, they're not going to move, and that's your job. It's like I find, um, and again, with the power of perspective and, you know, hours and hours of and classes and classes of teaching behind me that I can look and say, you know, I'm making it about me and it's not about me. If I'm so worried about, you know, like, of course, you want to be professional and you want to lead a class and you want to tell them to move limbs in a way 
but like if it's not about you, it's about their experience and what they're finding and how you can help them have those aha moments. And so mm-hmm. if you take your, I have to teach a perfect class, like, well, what is a perfect class? It's paying attention to the people in front of me and responding to them yeah. and what they're showing me. Um, so I think that that's nice, but I'm totally seconded. I think new Pilates teachers need a hug that they put way too much pressure <laughs> on themselves. They, they do, they do. Because like you're learning from teacher trainers and I'm like, there's a reason they're training teachers. Like they're good at what they do. They've done it for a long time. Like you're not going to be that when you are a baby teacher and that's okay because you're also polishing a rock, the rock of Pilates teaching. (laughs) But it's it's really curious as to where this idea comes from. And I'm I'm not sure there's many other industries that, that put this amount of pressure on new teachers. It's just insane. I, I'm I'm not sure if if it's because of the new models of of teacher training out there, or there's not enough time for the young your baby teachers to be apprenticed or mentored or or something. But yeah, there's there's a there's a it's kind of a little broken system. It's not quite working as it should. Yeah, there's definitely there's a gap in in some programs and maybe not even in the whole program, but for some people that when mm, mm. just like in physical therapy, like I've met the benchmarks, I've tested out, but I still don't feel like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, right. There's that little gap. <laughs> we just but, need to make that little leap. And and I try to share with people and ex- exactly what you've shared is that like it's okay to make mistakes that it's a process that, you know, you learn the more you do it when you won't improve as a teacher is if you if you stop teaching and say well I'll just teach when I'm perfect because that's not going to happen you gotta the only way out is through as far as I know yes (laughs) the last thing I want to touch on and I want to make sure we have time to talk about it is you are writing a book or you've written a book but there is a book and it is coming and it you coming. did it so <laughs> tell me all about your amazing book that's coming out i did uh, uh well it's um we've got a bit of photography to do but then it's kind of wrapped up um which is very exciting uh my book is coming out uh fingers crossed in december uh it's called a pilates journey and it actually started Speaking of new teachers, it's, it actually started as a response for new teachers coming to my studio and um, getting them up to speed with what how we do things in in our studio. Um, and there was there was a gap. There was a gap in in knowledge. There was a gap in experience, obviously because they're new. But the 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 interesting thing was the knowledge gaps that that I felt after you know, nearly 20 years of teaching that, oh, that's interesting. Why Why don't you know this? <laughs> um, so it was actually uh, started as a, a training manual for my studio so that I could give to new teachers and say, hey, everything you need to know about teaching classes in my studio, it's kind of in this book. Um, and so that's how it started. And then what was happening is that the, my, my students, my clients, we call them students, um, Became started becoming interested in oh what are you talking about and oh, what's this thing and so um, I expanded it and decided well just like little Dan back in his first Pilates day I thought oh why not I'll just put this together and see see what happens so it's a it's a bit of a dive into the exercises so it has has the the normal Pilates book stuff of the exercises and how to guide, but it's also the science behind the exercises. Why why do we use springs? What what's the benefit of using springs on a reformer as opposed to weights and that sort of thing? The physics and all that jazz, biomechanics, uh, and also I wanted to sort of demystify the history of. Joseph Pilates a little bit and dive into that. So it's got history, it's got science, and it's got the exercises. So it's kind of everything you need to know. (laughs) That sounds incredible. Um, And I'm especially excited about the history because Joe's history is not easy to track or follow. Like he is a mysterious dude. Crazy, crazy, crazy. 
when I was researching the history, it's it's been it's taken me ages to do the history research, and there are some good historical resources as Pilates teachers that we can access. There's some other good books, and I'm I'm not trying to replace any of those books, but what what I wanted to do with the history is have a look at what we actually know as opposed to the rumors and the what he said she said stuff and quite frankly i think the real the the truth what what the facts are way more interesting than the the, the stories so yeah i don't uh, i don't want to i know we we don't have a huge amount of time but it's um I, I'm I'm bursting at the seams to try and tell you all the history, but it's 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 very fascinating as to how he started and where he ended up, and it's kind of like a the irony is it's kind of like a Greek tragedy uh, in terms of who he is and where he ends up, and I think sometimes we get fixated on the exercises that he would be teaching. I mean, uh, as Pilates teaches. Many of us have seen the photos or little short films of him teaching, and and um, I think sometimes the the actual true genius is not the exercises; it's the equipment that that he developed. The exercises I'm going to be controversial here on your podcast is that um, mo- many of those exercises that we know as Pilates he took from elsewhere uh, and adapted, and that's that's the reality and. And where we are now in the Pilates industry, where people are coming up with new things and being told, that, no, that's not Pilates. Well, if he evolved exercises <laughs> and claimed it as Contrology or Pilates method, then why can't we? What, what, makes, what makes him so special? What makes the elders so special that they could adapt things and yet now we can't? That's, that's ridiculous. That's what- that's what I tell students in classes. I say, you know, every exercise was made up at one point. Like, yep. that's what we're doing. We're finding. It. And and it's not to be flippant and saying, like, we're just doing it on a trampoline now or whatever. But it's it's not to say, like, oh, we're not thinking about it. We're not caring. But just like we're talking about with our students when they interpret something differently or they do something differently or someone comes in like you potentially who is has fewer vertebrae than they did when they started. And you're like, hey, you know what? My back doesn't do that, actually, and not for lack of trying. (laughs) Like, (laughs) lack of bones is actually the issue here. So how can we use the equipment we have, the exercises we have, and then make it work for our person uh, who's there with us? Because, again, it's different. And and the, the the other genius of of the man is that it's a, an entire method. It's a it's an entire way of doing things, not just one exercise here or one exercise there. It's it's the whole package. So if you look at, I mean, Return to Life is kind of the only sort of documented uh, times that that he tells you how to do things that there's released to the public. Um, and you know the history of Pilates in the 1990s and early 2000s is a whole thing. But Return to Life is is a time capsule, and it's a moment in time where he's giving you 30 odd exercises to do that moves the entire body. But that's like towards the end of his life, anyway. That's the second half of his life. Where, and that's what he sort of refine things down to at that point. But who's to say in another 30, 40 years, he didn't refine things and move things on? Pilates is an ever-changing beastie. <laughs> it's, uh, it's ever-evolving. And the beautiful thing about it is that it can evolve. It can change. It, it, it changes when Mrs. Smith with a, a sore knee comes in and she's an 82 year old grandmother, and and then Bob Murphy comes in, and he's a f- professional footballer. Like you're not going to give them the same things. They don't need the same things. Give them what they need. Dan, that was beautiful. I didn't even want to stop. I just wanted there to be a little silence because that was um, very accurate. Thank you 
Oh, I want to keep talking to you, but alas, it is that time. Um, thank you so, so much um, for sharing your spirit and your joy and your approach to Pilates. I think one of the things I love about this podcast is that I get to showcase people who are doing really incredible things all over the world. And I definitely count you among the people out there doing absolutely incredible things. I cannot wait for your book. I cannot wait for December. It's winter in Australia right now. And I was like, well, I don't want to wait till my winter. I want to have it <laughs> it's now. It's very but cold I'm, here. Yeah. Very cold here. But I'm, but I'm, I'm so excited for you and this uh, new chapter of your Pilates adventure that now involves being an author in addition to a studio owner and uh, incredible Pilates teacher. But thank you so much for just taking the time and sharing yourself, your experiences. It's been an absolute blast, Olivia, as usual. Thanks for listening to this week's chapter of Pilates Teacher's Manual, your guide to becoming a great Pilates teacher. Check out the podcast Instagram at Pilates Teacher's Manual and be sure to subscribe wherever you listen. For more Pilates goodness, check out my other podcast, Pilates Student's Manual, available everywhere you listen to podcasts. The adventure continues. Until next time.